me start off with a fantasy, a fantasy I've had. It involves, well, I've overpowered his elite guard. I've fought my way into his secret bunker, and I've managed to knock his Luger out of his hand, his cyanide pill that he keeps to commit suicide rather than be captured. He snarls at me. He comes at me in a rage. We wrestle. I manage to pin him down, put handcuffs on him, and then say, Adolf Hitler, I arrest you for crimes against humanity. This is where the, the Medal of Honor version of this fantasy ends and the imagery begins to darken. What would I do if I actually had Hitler in my hands? And it's not hard to imagine once I allow myself sever his spine up. I don't know, can I? Is this on? Now it's on? Okay. So, not hard to imagine once I allow myself, sever his spine at the neck, take out his eyes with a blunt instrument, puncture his eardrums, cut out his tongue, leave him alive on a respirator, you know, tube fed, not able to move, not able to speak, not able to hear, to see, just to feel, and then inject him with something cancerous that will infest every single cell in his body. Now, I've had this fantasy since I was a kid, and I still do sometimes, and when I really think about it, my heart beats faster. And it's all these plans for like the most evil, wicked soul in history. Except there's a problem, which is I don't believe in souls, and I don't believe in evil, and I think wicked is only appropriate for a musical. But on the other hand, there's, there's all sorts of people I wouldn't mind seeing killed, but I'm against the death can penalty, but I watch all sorts of violent, schlocky movies, but I'm for very strict gun control. But then there was this one time I was in a laser tag place, and I had such a good time hiding in a corner, shooting at people over and over, until this like pimply kid zapped me like a million times in a row, and then snickered at me, and made me feel very unmanly. So essentially what is obvious here is I'm your typical human when it comes to this extremely confusing topic of violence. Now, obviously, as a species, we have problems with violence. We have used shower heads to deliver poison gas, letters with anthrax, passenger planes as weapons, mass rape as a military strategy. We are a miserably violent species. But there's a complication with that, which is we don't hate violence. We hate the wrong kind of violence. Because when it's the right kind, we leap in, we pay good money to watch it, we hand out medals, we vote for, we mate with the people who are masters at it. When it's the right kind of violence, we love it. And there's an additional complication, because amid us being this miserably violent species, we're also a extraordinarily compassionate and altruistic one. So how do you begin to make sense of us, the biology of us at our best moments and our worst moments and all those ambiguous ones in between? Now, one thing that is clear is it is utterly boring to understand the biology of the motoric aspects of your behavior. Your brain tells your spine, tells your muscles to do something and hooray, you've behaved. What's incredibly complicated is understanding the meaning of the behavior because in one setting, Firing a gun is some appalling act in another. It's an act of like heroic self-sacrifice. In one setting, putting your hand on top of someone else's is deeply compassionate. In another, it's a deep betrayal. The challenge for us is to understand the biology of the context of our behaviors. And that one is really, really challenging. And one thing that's clear is you are never going to really understand what's going on if you get it into your head that you're going to be able to explain everything with this is the part of the brain or the gene or the hormone or the childhood experience or the evolutionary mechanism that explains everything because it doesn't work that way. Instead, any behavior that occurs is the outcome of the biology that occurred a second before and an hour before and all the way to a million years before. Okay, so to give you some sense of this, okay, so you're in some situation, there's a, a crisis, there's a crisis, there's rioting, violence going on, people running around, and there's a stranger running at you in an agitated state. And 
You can't quite be sure what their facial expression is. Maybe they're angry, maybe they're frightened, maybe it's threatening. They've got something in their hand that seems like a handgun and you're standing there and you have a gun and they come running at you and you shoot. And then it turns out that what they had in their hand was a cell phone instead. And thus we ask a biological question, why did that behavior occur in you? And what's really the central point is, that's a whole hierarchy of questions. Why did that behavior occur? What went on one second before in your brain that brought about that behavior? Now to begin to understand that, the part of the brain that's at the top of the list of usual suspects is a brain region called the amygdala. You want to think about aggression and think about the brain, you think about the amygdala. If you stimulate the amygdala in an experimental lab animal, you get an outburst of aggression. Humans who have rare types of seizures that start there, rare types of tumors based on the amygdala, uncontrollable violence. If you damage the amygdala, you blunt the ability of an organism to be aggressive. Okay, so the amygdala is about violence. <coughs> Except if you sit down your typical amygdologist and ask them what the amygdala is about, that's not the first word that's going to come out of their mouths. Because for most people studying it, what the amygdala is about is fear. Fear and anxiety and learning to be afraid. In other words, we've just learned something very interesting, which is you cannot understand the first thing about the neurobiology of violence without understanding the neurobiology of fear. And a world in which no amygdaloid neuron need be afraid, there'd be an awful lot more of us sleeping between lions and lamps. Now the thing to begin to make sense of with the amygdala is what parts of the brain does it talk to and which regions talks to it in turn. Now a next region that is incredibly interesting is called the insular cortex. Now, the insular cortex is in fact incredibly boring if you're a lab rat or any other mammal on Earth because it does something very straightforward. You bite into a piece of food and it's spoiled and rotten and fetid and rancid and all of that. And what happens is, as a result, your insular cortex activates and it triggers all sorts of reflexes. Your stomach lurches, you gag, you spit it out, you, you, you have a gag reflex. Very useful, it keeps mammals from eating poisonous foods. And you do the same thing with human, get a nice human volunteer who inexplicably is convinced to bite into this food that's rancid and disgusting, and they're in a brain scanner and their insular cortex activates. We do something fancier, all we have to do is think about eating something disgusting and the insular cortex activates. But then something much more subtle. Sit down someone in your brain scanner and have them tell you about a time they did something miserable and rotten to some other human. Or tell them about some other occurrence of some human doing something miserable and rotten to somebody else and the insular cortex will activate. In every other mammal on Earth, it does gustatory disgust. But in us, it also does moral disgust. And what that tells you is why it is if something is sufficiently morally appalling, we feel sick to our stomachs. It leaves a bad taste in our mouths. We feel soiled by it. We feel nauseous. We feel because our brain invented this symbolic thing of moral mores and standards some 40, 50,000 years ago and didn't invent a new part of the brain at the time. And instead, there was presumably some sort of big committee meeting and they said, okay, moral disgust, there's there's that insular that does like food disgust. There's, okay, it's in their portfolio now. Give me some duct tape. The insular cortex is now gonna do moral disgust as well. And it has trouble telling the difference. And no surprise, the main part of the brain the insular cortex talks to in the human brain is the amygdala. Because once it decides this thing is disgusting, you're a couple of steps away from it being scary, it being menacing, it being something you need to act against. Now, in lots of ways, it's very cool the insular cortex does this because suppose you see some moral ill that needs to be cured and some of the time that can take enormous self-sacrifice. That could take the ultimate sacrifice in some cases and if moral outrage was this 
abstraction, this, dis this sort of distanced sort of state, it would be hard to pick up a head of steam to really be able to act against it. The viscera, your stomach churning, that's where the force comes to, to make a moral imperative imperative. That's great, but then there's a downside because the insular cortex is not very good at remembering it's only a metaphor that you were feeling disgusted. And suddenly, you have that whole problem of the world of people who are disgusted by somebody's behavior, which in somebody else's eyes is just a normal, loving lifestyle. Disgust is a moving target in time and space. And there's the danger to decide that being morally disgusted by something is a pretty good litmus test for deciding between right and wrong. And we sure know all the ways in which that can get you into trouble. And probably most of all, every ideologue in history has had a brilliant intuitive feeling for how the insular cortex works, which is if you can get your minion to the point that when you talk about them, them living in the next valley, them who think differently than you, who pray differently, who love differently, if you can get your followers to the point that when you invoke them, insular cortex activate because there's something just disgusting about them, you're 90% of the way towards pulling off your successful genocide. A key to every good sort of genocidal movement is taking them and turning them into being such infestations and malignancies and whatevers that they hardly even count as human anymore. Okay, so we've got this sort of axis between the insular cortex and the amygdala. Meanwhile, we've got the most interesting part of the brain, far and away, <coughs> a region called the frontal cortex. Frontal cortex, I've just wasted the last 35 years of my life studying a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is kind of interesting and like it's done well by me and I've been, you know, that sort of, but I wish I'd been studying the front. The frontal cortex, it's the most recently evolved part of the human brain. We've got more of it than any other species on Earth. And what does it do? The frontal cortex makes you do the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. And impulse control and gratification postponement and long-term planning and emotional regulation. And what does the frontal cortex spend an awful lot of time doing? Sending inhibitory projections down to the amygdala, hoping to race there in time to say, wait a second, are you sure that's really a handgun? Wait a second, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I know this seems like a brilliant idea right now, but believe me, you are going to regret it. The frontal cortex very often racing to try to control the amygdala. Now, there's this picture of the frontal cortex. All it does is occasionally go slumming down the amygdala and preach to it about like temperance or whatever. But in fact, there's bi-directionality. The amygdala has plenty of means to talk to the frontal cortex. What's that about? Every time we're in a moment of extreme aroused state and we make a decision that is hideously stupid and disastrous that seems brilliant at the time because that's the frontal cortex being marinated in what's down below. In other words, there's this very tempting view that the frontal cortex most recently evolved. It's this sh gleaming, shining, computer-like part of our brain. It's sitting there just marinating and all the emotive yuck going on underneath. It's bi-directional communication. Now, finally, in terms of making sense of this frontal cortex, the whole notion of doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do is a value-free judgment. What do I mean by this? Sometimes you have to have an incredibly strong, aerobically studly frontal cortex to resist the temptation to lie. And that's at the centerpiece of some of the most important sort of crossroads in our lives. However, once you decide that you are going to lie, you need your frontal cortex to do it effectively because it's your frontal cortex that says, okay, remember, don't make eye contact, don't use this right cheek muscle at that point because you're gonna be tempted to twitch, keep your voice under control. It could take an enormous amount of discipline to go and effectively like make the world whole in a better place, but it can also take an awful lot of discipline in staying up late and studying to be effective at ethnically cleansing villages. The frontal cortex is value-free in that sense. Okay, so we've gotten a sense of a couple of the brain regions here that are pertinent. So that's what's going on in one second before. But 
no brain is an island, and what we now have to do is take a step back. So what was going on in the seconds to minutes before in the sensory environment which triggered that amygdala to do this or that frontal cortex to do that? What are the stimuli that are coming in there? Now, obviously, in the scenario, we have the sight, the sounds of this rioting perfectly pertinent to making sense there. But then there's a whole world of sensory stuff going on that's subliminal, that you hardly even know is there. And if you did, not in a million thing years would you think it's pertinent. For example, when you have to make split-second decisions, you are more likely to mistake a cell phone for a handgun if the person holding it is male, is large, is of another race your brain processes that in 50 milliseconds. That is 1 20th of a second. Your brain is already distinguishing that incorrectly. Why is that? That turned out to have a really interesting piece of the wiring of the amygdala. Okay, so suppose you look at somebody and there's something in their hand that's either a cell phone or a handgun. So what happens? The information goes from your eye to this way station of the brain and eventually gets to your visual cortex. And a first layer there sits and spends some time and figures out what the pixels are. And then the second layer turns the pixels into lines. And then the next layer turns the lines into curves. And eventually you got a four dimensional sort of picture of whatever. And and eventually some neurons in your cortex says, oh my, I believe that's a handgun and let's go wake up the amygdala and let it know about it. That's the simple part. It turns out there's a shortcut, the very first way station where sensory information comes in, shortcuts directly to the amygdala. In other words, the amygdala knows there's a handgun while your, your visual cortex is still futzing around with the pixels there. That's very good, that's very helpful that it gets that information quickly, but it turns out you need all those computational layers in your visual cortex to tell what's there accurately. In other words, the amygdala gets sensory information that's very emotionally aroused before your conscious cortex does, and the accuracy is not great. And thus, if you're tired, if you're hungry, if you're in pain, if there's a bad smell around, if any of those things are happening, you are biasing the amygdala towards mistaking a neutral facial expression for a threatening one, mistaking a cell phone for a handgun, all of that occurring in the seconds before. Okay, but now we need to take a step further back. What about hours to days before? How was that affecting how sensitive you are to sensory information, which then talks to your amygdala and the solar cortex, all of that? What we've moved into here is the realm of hormones. And in that regard, amid a gazillion hormones that are pertinent, two of them stand out above all others. First one, the inevitable usual suspect hormone that's got to be pulled in at this point, which is testosterone. Okay, what is testosterone about? Testosterone is the reason why males in every culture and every species on earth are such pains in the asses. Testosterone causes aggression. Testosterone does not cause aggression. What testosterone does is bias you towards interpreting ambiguous social information as being threatening, as being provocative. Take somebody and pump them up with testosterone, and they decide that neutral facial expressions seen for a 20th of a second are threatening. Take testosterone and that brief exposure to that neutral facial expression, and suddenly the amygdala is all agitated and frothing at the mouth. What testosterone does is it exaggerates pre-existing tendencies. What it does is sensitize you to whatever social learning you've received about what kind of aggression is just fine and what kind isn't. Now, the single most interesting thing about testosterone is even that's not what it really does. Testosterone doesn't make organisms more aggressive. What testosterone does is it makes more orga organisms more likely to do whatever behavior is needed to hold on to high status when it's being challenged. Okay, if you're a baboon, what that means is aggression, because if somebody's threatening you, it's gonna be all about aggression. That's the entire world of the baboon. Remarkably, in humans, put somebody in an economic game where you get high status by being generous in the offers you make, and testosterone makes people more generous. The problem isn't that testosterone causes aggression. The problem is that we reward aggression with status so readily. And what that also tells you is, if you took a gazillion 
Buddhist monks and shot them up with testosterone, they'd be running around in like frenzied gangs doing random acts of kindness <laughs> to see who could do the most of them most quickly. The problem here is not the hormone, it's the values and the rewards that we place on aggression. Okay, meanwhile, in that span of hours to days, the other hormone that has just as undeserved of a reputation, but in the opposite direction, is this hormone oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is officially, to sort of use endocrine jargon, it's officially the grooviest hormone on earth. Because oxytocin is by now famous, it causes bonding between mothers and infants and pair bonding between monogamous couples and it makes you more expressive and emotionally sensitive and more cooperative and more charitable and more trusting. And there's a whole new horrifying field of neuroscience called neuromarketing where if you spritz oxytocin up people's noses, they're more likely to believe all sorts of gibberish and nonsense of people trying to sell you stuff, whether it's their political viewpoint or some gigaw. I mean, if they could spray oxytocin through the vents in like Costco all over this country, what that would do to the economy of like sort of the nonsense that people would buy. Okay, so oxytocin promotes pro-social behavior until you look more closely. And what recent work shows is that's exactly what oxytocin does. It makes you much more cooperative and generous and charitable and all of that with people who you categorize as being just like you. It makes you pro more pro-social towards in-group members. And when it comes to out-group members, it makes people more xenophobic and more preemptively aggressive and less cooperative. And the greatest study showing this was a couple of years ago. And this was a group in the Netherlands where they got their usual sort of lab rats, which was college volunteers from some like university there. And what they did was they gave everyone the standard classic problem in philosophy, the runaway trolley problem. Is it okay to sacrifice one person, push them in front of a runaway trolley to save five? And there's a whole world of research done on that. So they sort of established the baseline levels at which people would be willing to push somebody to save five. Now what they did was they gave the person they were pushing onto the track a name. A third of the time, the person would get a name that apparently is just like your stereotypical Dutch name, Dirk or Peter or something like that. A third of the time, or the remainder of the time, either of the two groups that people in Holland tend to have a lot of outgroup hostility towards, Germans, oh that's right, World War II, or people with Muslim names. So now you've got the scenario, do you push Dirk in front of the trolley? Do you push Otto in front of the trolley? Do you push Mahmoud in front of the trolley? And what they show is, give people oxytocin and they're less likely to sacrifice Dirk, whereas they can't leap fast enough to push Wolfgang and Ahmoud <laughs> there under the tracks. Oxytocin doesn't make us nicer, it makes us nicer to people we're already predisposed towards being nice to. It exaggerates us, them contrasts. Okay, so now stepping back further, how about weeks to months before? And this has now entered the realm of neural plasticity, the fact that the brain can change in response to experience. And for example, if you've now just spent these last few months mired in trauma and stress, your amygdala will have grown larger. It will have formed new connections. The circuits there will be more excitable and your frontal cortex will have become more sluggish and atrophied. In other words, at that critical moment, the amygdala is in a more hysterical, hyperreactive state, and the frontal cortex has much that much less capacity to get there in time and say, wait a second, are you sure before you pull the trigger there, you can see that changing. Okay, but stepping back even further, now going back years, decades, how about adolescence? What going on in adolescence is relevant now to this one second of whether or not you're gonna pull that trigger? And the central fact of the adolescent brain is that all of the brain is going full blast, fully mature, except for the frontal cortex, which is still half-baked at that point. Amazingly, the frontal cortex, it's the last part of the brain to fully mature, it is not fully online until you are about 25 years old, which explains an enormous amount of freshman year in college. It's the last part of the brain to fully mature. What does that mean? It means adolescence and early adulthood is the time of life where environment, 
and experience are sculpting your frontal cortex into the adult version you are gonna have in that one critical moment there deciding what the outcome is. What that also tells you is if this is the last part of the brain to fully mature, it's the part of the brain least shaped by genes and most shaped by environment. Okay, but now stepping even further back, how about back to your childhood, back to your fetal life, obviously pertinent because that's when your brain was being constructed. But what people also have learned in recent years is experience, experience during that period causes changes, jargon in the field, epigenetic changes, causes permanent changes in some genes and parts of your body are turned on forever after, other genes are turned off for lifetime consequences, Ah, in other words, childhood matters. This is one of the molecular mechanisms by which childhood matters. And as a very pertinent example of that, if you have spent your fetal nine months being just bathed in high levels of stress hormones from mom's circulation, because she is extremely stressed, as an adult, thanks to epigenetic changes during your fetal life, your amygdala is gonna be hyperreactive and you're gonna secrete higher levels of stress hormones, which makes the amygdala even more reactive and makes the frontal cortex sluggish. So events back in fetal life. But going back even further, okay, back to when all you were was a fertilized egg and a bunch of genes. Now, obviously, genes have tons to do with everything here, but here is the great temptation to decide that genes are determining anything. Genes determine essentially nothing when it comes to behavior because genes work differently in different environments. And the most pertinent example here is a gene called monoamine, monoamine oxidase A, MAOA, do not even dream of writing that down, but MAOA comes in a bunch of different flavors, a bunch of different variants, and if you have one particular variant, you are very significantly more likely as an adult to commit antisocial violence, if and only if you were abused as a child. If you weren't, having that gene variant has zero increase in your risk factor. It's not your genes, it's the way the genes interact with your environment. And thus, starting with fetal life, the interactions between genes and environment are going to shape enormously what state your brain is in in that one critical second now of do you pull the trigger or not. Okay, but you gotta go even further back, past you as a single organism, how about your ancestors? What were they up to? For example, if your ancestors were pastoralists, people wandering deserts and grasslands with their herds of camels or cows or goats, the odds are they would have invented what is called a culture of honor. High levels of retributive violence, clan vendettas, warrior classes, that's the whole world of if they come and take your camel and you do nothing about it, the next day they'll come and take your entire turd, herd and your wives and daughters too, clan violence going on for centuries. And what is clear is if your ancestors were of a culture of honor centuries later, that's still influencing the values with which you were being raised, including within moments of birth, how often mothers are holding their children. So centuries worth of that. Okay, but steps further back, where are the cultural differences coming from? From ecosystems. One example of that, you look at people living in deserts and historically, they're likely to come up with monotheistic religions. Look at people in rainforests and they come up with polytheistic religions. Look at people in East Asia who live in flat plain areas and they grow rice, which requires collectivist farming and you get a very collectivist mindset about cooperation. Get people in the hill countries there and they grow wheat, which is done in individual families, and you get the same individualistic mindset that you get in people living in Manhattan. All of it ecologically shaped. But then we gotta go even further back because if you're talking about genes anywhere along the way, you're talking about the evolution of the genes. And what you wind up seeing is evolution has sculpted different primate species into having different characteristic levels of aggression. Some primate species have virtually none at another extreme, immensely high levels. And there's all sorts of biological traits that go along with the two extremes. And what about us? We're somewhere right in the middle between the two extremes.
Okay, so in other words, if you want to understand why did this behavior occur, you've got to take into account everything from one second before to a million years before. Okay, so what do you conclude from that? Ooh, it's complicated. Okay, that's very useful, but how about, ooh, it's complicated, and you better be real careful and real cautious before you decide you understand the causes of a behavior, especially if it's a behavior that you ha judge harshly, because things can really go wrong with the wrong attributions, and we have a very dark stained history of that occurring precisely for those reasons. Now for me, when I look at all of this information, the single thing that I find to be most important has to do with change. Every single biological fact that I've given along the way here is subject to change over time. Ecosystems change. Thousands of years ago, the Sahara was a lush grassland filled with hippos and giraffe. Cultures change. In the 17th century, the scariest people in all of Europe were the Swedes, who spent that whole century rampaging all over Europe, and the Swedes have not had a war in 203 years. They changed. And most of all, brains change. Circuits form, neurons weaken, patterns grow, parts of brains expand, and as a result, people change. And they could change extraordinarily. Some examples of it change in people that can occur over the course of decades. A man who moves me enormously, a man by the name of John Newton, he was a British theologian, he was a leading abolitionist, played a central role in the, role in the banning of slavery at the beginning of the 1800s in England. John Newton spent the early decades of his adult life as the captain of a slave ship. And after he retired from that, he spent decades as a local parson still investing in the slave trade and growing rich from it until one day something changed in him. Something changed, something changed, and he celebrated it in, in the thing that he is most known for historically in a hymn that he wrote, Amazing Grace. Another example. A, nam, a man named Zenji Abe, who on the morning of December 6th, 1941, was the lead pilot in one of the bombardier squadrons that took off from an Air Force base in Japan and attacked Pearl Harbor. He was one of their star pilots. He led one of the divisions there, and 50 years later to the day, as an old man, he came towards a ceremony at Pearl Harbor commemorating it, as an old man came forward in broken English and apologized to some of the elderly survivors on the ground there and spent the rest of his life close with some of them. Think about that transformation. If one of those men that he befriended had become a captive of his during World War II, he might have happily walked him to death in the Bataan Death March. And if he had been a captive of one of those American men who had killed him, he might very well have taken his skull as a souvenir, which was a standard thing done in the Pacific during World War II with dead Japanese. And instead, 50 years later, he's writing a letter to that man's grandchildren, consoling them when grandpa has died change can occur even faster over the course of hours. And the example that just mesmerizes me was the first winter of World War I, the Christmas truce of 1914. Powers that be had worked out a truce that was supposed to go for a couple of hours, and the idea was along the trenches of France, people would be able to come out and retrieve bodies from no man's land and go and bury them. So German and F British troops came out and retrieved bodies. And soon, they helped each other carry the bodies. And soon, they helped each other dig graves in the frozen ground. And then they prayed together over the dead. And then they shared Christmas dinner. And then they exchanged gifts. And by the next day, they were playing soccer together up and down no man's land and exchanging addresses to get together and see each other after the war was over. And those truces went on for two to three days until the officers had to arrive and threatened to shoot these men unless they went back to killing each other. And all it took was a couple of hours to completely reorganize these people's sense of who counts as an us as an a them, and us being all of us in these trenches on both sides, dying for no damn reason, and them being the faceless powers behind the lines, using us as just pawns. And sometimes change can occur in the course of seconds to minutes. Now, historically, probably the single 
biggest horror in terms of American consciousness from the Vietnam War was the My Lai Massacre. A brigade of American soldiers went into an undefended village full of civilians and killed between 350 and 500 of them, gang raped women and girls beforehand, mutilated bodies, utterly nightmarish because it occurred because the US government covered it up for as long as possible, because ultimately they just did slapping of a few wrists and because it was not a singular incident, it was one of the nightmares of the Vietnam War. The My Lai Massacre was stopped by one man, a man named Hugh Thompson. Thompson was piloting a helicopter gunship, flying over the village, and was seeing American soldiers firing activity, oh, they're under attack, by Viet Cong, landed there, got out, and was viewing the incomprehensible sight of American soldiers shooting elderly women, digging out babies from underneath the bodies of their mothers and shooting them, and figured out what was happening. And Hugh Thompson got into his helicopter and in the course of minutes undid every bit of training he had had as to who is an us and who is a them. He took his helicopter, landed it between the last group of surviving villagers there, and American soldiers coming at them with their weapons, landed his helicopter and turned his machine guns on the American soldiers and said, if you do not stop, I will mow you all down. And what is most important to me is none of these guys had fancier neurons than any of us. Same neurotransmitters, same genes, same enzymes, no fancier than any of us. What I think we're left with here at the end is a version of like that inevitable, exasperating cliche, those who don't study history are destined to be able to repeat it. What we have here, I think, is the opposite. Those who don't study the history of extraordinary human change and those who don't study the science of how we more readily go from the worst of our behaviors to the best ones are destined not to be able to repeat unbelievable, magnificent moments like these. So let me stop at this point, and if there's any questions. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, good. Someone coming to the microphone. So what's happening in the future of uh, neurology that would give us hope for understanding the brain better, having better outcomes? Okay. Um, let me just take this book here that I happen to see sitting here. Um, <laughs> let's see. I haven't read this yet, but <laughs> I skimmed it for the picture. Okay. Here's one figure. I don't know if you could particularly see it on the left page. It's a whole bunch of graphs, and the whole point is it's a bunch of graphs that are doing like this for a long stretch, and then suddenly they do that. What those are are the number of publications by year in various topics I talk about. For example, at the top one, 2002, 2006, 2010, 2000, the number of papers in the medical literature concerning the topic of oxytocin and trust. Everything about it has been learned in the last 10 years. Here we have brain and aggression. 1985, there were essentially zero papers published. By the last decade, more than 2,000. Every single one of these, the vast majority of what we've learned has come in the last whatever short amount of time. We're only a couple of hundred years into understanding that epilepsy is a neurological disease and not demonic possession. We're only about 50 years into understanding certain types of learning disabilities are due to micro malformations in the cortex in people with dyslexia, and it's not laziness or lack of motivation. The vast majority of these factoids are 10, 20 years old, and all that's going to happen is we're going to learn more and more of that stuff. And what we're going to learn more and more is to recognize the extent to which we are biological organisms and our behaviors have to be evaluated in that realm. For my money, what that eventually does is make words like soul or evil utterly absurd and medieval, but it also makes words like punishment or justice very questionable as well. I think it will require an enormous reshaping of how we think we deal with the most damaging of human behaviors, because none of it can be thought of outside the context of biology.
Well, you did mention Richard, the, the, the Buddhist, but I have a sense that in my life, at least, I've been exposed to a number of techniques for uh, creating people that are like that. For example, uh, Buddhist people who practice Vipassana, um, people who uh, undergo psychoanalysis uh, or theories, activities that come from that, group, group relations work or group therapy. Uh, there are tools that have that effect. What I'm, con uh, what I'm wondering about is why those things are not customary. Not, they're not, they're not institutions. I mean, we don't have, for example, UDC is a, doesn't have a program to, to cause people in the community to meet together. There are packages that can do that, but it doesn't happen. And what's why is that? Well, the easy punchline is because they're usually really hard to do. One example that comes to mind, okay, so you've got conflicting groups that for decades, for millennia, have had us-them dichotomies in their head, have been at each other's throats, and for decades, this notion has been floating around among psychologists, something called contact theory, which is if you bring people from hostile opposing groups together and they get to know each other, they're going to recognize, hey, we're all the same there and it's going to be wondrous and we're all going to be like singing kumbaya and this is going to be terrific and that's been the motivation for all sorts of these programs taking Palestinian and Israeli teenagers and putting them in summer camps Irish kids, Northern Irish Catholics and Protestants, all of those endless versions of these and what that extremely large literature has shown by now is when it works right it absolutely reduces intergroup conflict, can cause lasting changes in perception where people could generalize it beyond not just ooh now I know there's one Israeli guy I know who's actually a good guy, could, could, generalize, could generalize even to other groups of them nonetheless most of the ways in which you set those settings up wind up making things worse because it's very narrow domains where these things act. You've got to get everybody on equal grounds. They have to have shared goals. They have to have an absence of any symbols that are viewed as provocative. And if you have it anything other than that, you're going to make things worse. In other words, none of these things are done easily, but they're all workable. Let's see, question. You talked about the um, critical time of adolescence in the development of, our, of what we consider right and wrong. And how do you address the generation of coming up of, that have been just inundated with violence within their media, within their video games that they play, and the it sort of desensitizes them to acts of violence? Okay, I, as a parent, am absolutely horrified by all that stuff and can easily go off onto a rant about all the bad consequences of it. And I could find papers now that are looking at video violence and the desensitizing effects. And, and if I really feel like going down to the, like the second sub-basement in sort of the Stanford Medical Library and pull out journals from the 60s, and there are the exact same papers there where all you need to do is replace the word television with video games. Television radio violence in the 1930s with like detective stories of who knows what. Every single generation has wrestled with this and when you go through the massive literature looking at each new incarnation, what you see is on the average all of those forms of violence cause a short-term burst in violent behavior in individuals. It disinhibits it. But in terms of whether it has long-term consequences, in every one of those realms, you get a very familiar punchline. Violent media makes aggressive individuals more aggressive. It has no effects on anybody else because what it does is legitimizes and habituates and disinhibits individuals who already have the predisposition towards just like testosterone, it does not ag invent aggression, it exacerbates pre-existing social tendencies towards it. So in that regard, the good news is it's no worse than like, you know, cop dramas sitting by the like fireside chats in the 1930s with the radio there. The bad effects are nonetheless, those who are vulnerable, this is a more vivid, more visceral, more real form of imitating an awful reality than anything that's been invented before but the general effects turn out not to be terribly malevolent. Yeah. Oh, hi. Well, in your talk, you point out 
how complicated it is to explain a behavior. And you know, the example you use, well, you could put that, that person with the, you know, trying to figure out if the thing in the hand was a gun, could be a, you know, obviously a police officer. I mean, it could be anybody in that situation. And uh, a lot of neuroscience has been brought into the courtroom I mean, for that matter, it's been brought into the classroom, too, to try to, you know, use a brain scan to explain something. But I wondered, in, in particular, in the courtroom, how do you, s where do you see that headed, you know, where people are bringing brain scans and says, well, the brain, you know, my brain made me do it rather than me or whatever? Um, great question. Insanely contentious field. Um, there's some very scary, smart people I've had to argue with at times, sort of taking the viewpoint that neuroscience is nowhere ready for prime time yet for its appearance in courts. Just to give you a sense of where neuroscience plays a role in the American criminal justice system, uh, the gold standard for deciding that somebody who has committed a crime is so organically impaired that they can't be held responsible for their acts is if they basically cannot tell the difference between right and wrong which is usually a way of describing extreme sort of schizophrenic psychosis. This is something called the McNaughton Rule and was based on an individual, almost certainly a paranoid schizophrenic, who delusionally hearing voices attempted to assassinate the Prime Minister of England in 1840. That's the legal standard in the United States based on neuroscience from 1840. I mean, I don't think horses even, even evolved brains at that point, and that's the basis by which the legal system works. The area that the legal system in the United States has incorporated exactly zero neuroscience is the realm of volitional impairment, the realm of people who do know the difference between right and wrong who nonetheless cannot regulate their behavior. Where is that? that's when you see damage to the frontal cortex. And you get somebody there who can tell you absolutely which is the appropriate thing to switch for. You can reach for five M&Ms, but you only get one as a reward. Or if you reach for one M&M, you get five as a reward. And they will say, yeah, I know how it works. I need to reach for the one because then I get much more M&Ms and they go for the wrong one at the last instant. When you have frontal damage, you pass the McNaughton test. You know the difference between right and wrong, and nonetheless, you cannot regulate their, your behavior. There is no state in this country that regularly accepts volitional impairment defenses in a criminal court. Two horrifying statistics that are pertinent to that. 25% of the men on death row in this country have a history of concussive head trauma to their frontal cortex. Other horrifying factoid, by the time you are five years old, the socioeconomic status of your parents is a predictor of the levels of stress hormones in your bloodstream. What do you know? It goes in the direction of the poorer you are, the more stress hormones, and the more stress hormones, the less frontal maturation. By kindergarten, your SES, by kindergarten, if you were foolish enough to have picked the wrong family to have been born into, that is already going to impact the metabolism of your frontal cortex, the thickness of it, the number of connections being made there. By age five, you are already three steps behind in terms of frontal regulation of behavior because of SES differences in this country. So in that realm, the consequences, I think, are enormous and hugely underappreciated. I think we've last two questions. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I'll try and articulate my question. It has to do with the role of testosterone and the maybe the and maybe some consequences of it and what we can do about it. So if if uh, um, if it's not related to aggression, but it's related to the an increased um, reward for status, where does it act in the brain? Does it act in the brain? And then, given that so many kids may suffer, especially these days, with um, impacts in the brain that might affect their aggression as adults. They have some, the, given the violence in the world today, would a pharmaceutical route be at all suggested before they get, before any kind of cognitive training? Because it's a, a you know, the drug industry will, will, will latch onto anything, but I feel like that's something they haven't done. And I, but I don't think that's a long term solution either. Great. Um, Okay, which part of the brain has the most receptors for testosterone, the most sensitivity to it? Makes total sense, the amygdala. The amygdala is ground zero for sensitivity to testosterone. Does testosterone cause amygdala neurons to fire to, in effect, invent aggressive outputs? Not at all. If and only if the neurons are already firing, testosterone makes them fire faster.
testosterone does not turn on the martial music. It ups the volume if it's already been turned on. Now, in terms of, okay, so let's make the world a much better place here. How about we get rid of all those males? Okay, maybe not that. Okay, so at least let's castrate. Well, no, that's not very well. What about, okay, how about if we pharmacologically block some of the effects of testosterone? And what you see there, besides it being mighty scary, is a track record of not working very well in a number of places on Earth. The two places where it has most been explored is, big surprise, India and the state of Texas. There have been state-ordered chemical castrations, drugs which are given which block testosterone receptors, which is in effect the equivalent of removing testosterone from the scene, usually for intractably violent sexual offenders. And what the legislate, what the literature shows is essentially it has no effect whatsoever because such aggression has very little to do with aggression. It has very little to do with sexuality. It has a whole lot to do with domination and fear and issues like that. Pertinent to that, you take any male on Earth of any known species and take out his testes, and that almost certainly was the first experiment ever done in endocrinology about 10,000 years ago when, like, some bull chased some people around the backyard one time too many, and they wrestled him down and got rid of the testes, and suddenly he was a much more tractable male. If you castrate a male of any species out there, on the average, levels of aggression go down. They never go down to zero, though. And the critical thing is the more experience that male had being aggressive prior to castration, the more it's going to stay there afterward. In other words, the more experience you have with aggression, the less it is dependent on hormones and the more it is a function of social learning. So that, unfortunately or otherwise, is not much of a panacea there. Let's see, final question? Yep, final question. Hopefully a more optimistic, uh, <laughs> you know, we can end on a more optimistic note. So you mentioned the chronicity of um, the amygdala enlarging with chronic stress. And uh, there are things perhaps that we could do for people who have experienced chronic stress. I'm thinking of people who have been on multiple tours overseas and have not had to be exposed to horrendous things and do horrendous things. Um, so now that we're having people do that more often, they're coming back and then ending their lives. And I'm, I'm wondering, I know people have tried meditation, maybe yoga might work, but are there ways that even with the example of testosterone and really the amygdala, that the role of the amygdala in, in evoking aggression, um, are there ways that we can reduce the size of the aggression or, or the size of the amygdala? Yeah. yeah. Um, the realm where that's been most studied is with PTSD, um, combat trauma, PTSD, and uh, sexual violence, PTSD, um, where you see with the PTSD there, you get expansion of the amygdala. It becomes hyperreactive. It is overgeneralized into it being a terrifying world out there. Um, my lab for a while was doing some gene therapy work on trying to protect the amygdala from stress hormones in ways that like as a circus trick was kind of useful but is not going to help a mammal anytime in the next century or so. Um, my sense from sort of the clinicians I've spent my time around is that PTSD is not really anything that's ever cured. People learn how to manage it, how to contain it. There is no clear biological cure for it. But something fascinating and horrifying has emerged in the literature in recent years. What is PTSD about? It's obvious to anyone out. It's fear. It's terror. It's the trauma of people trying to kill you, of watching your buddies killed around you left and right. It's, it is anchored in fear and the fear of the violence that may harm you and those who you love. But the whole field has had to accommodate an extraordinary finding in recent years, which is drone operators get PTSD. They get PTSD at the same rate as do warriors out on the battlefield. Drone operators sitting there living in some suburb of Edwards Air Force Base somewhere out there who get up in the morning and remember to drop off the clothing at the cleaners and get into traffic jams and barely make it to work on time and then sit in a simulator there for eight hours blowing up people on the other side of the planet and then rush out at the end of the day to watch their little girl in a ballet concert and then go back to killing on the other side of the globe the next day, these people have PTSD at the same rate as do the actual soldiers.
and that has completely challenged the notion of what it's about. It's not the fact that there is nothing more abnormal and terrifying to us than the notion of somebody violently killing us, that rather it's the utterly bizarre and abnormal notion of us killing someone else. And that's causing an enormous rethinking as to what PTSD is about. And lurking in there is a little bit of optimism. A man named David Grossman, who was a colonel in the US military, wrote a very influential book called On Killing, analyzed the history of the extraordinary percentage of people throughout wars in the middle of battle where their lives were on the line at any given second who nonetheless never fired their guns that there is an enormous inhibition against doing that. After the Battle of Gettysburg, there were something like 14,000 rifles left next to the dead in the field there that were collected. The majority of them had not been fired. The majority of them had been loaded repeatedly. I'm just about to shoot, I'd better load. Oh, I'd better load again, I'd better load again. Enormous inhibitions against that. And he argues that somewhere in there is the greatest bit of optimism. Asking people to kill somebody faceless on the other side of the planet, that's easy. Asking them to kill somebody whose eyes they see from 10 feet away hand to hand, there's historically an enormous inhibition against that. That's some room for optimism there. Nonetheless, in the context of the US military now trains more drone pilots than actual pilots. What do you do about that? Oh, good. <laughs> well, remember what I was saying before about castrating males or, oh, I don't know. Just hold our breaths and try not to fall into too much despair. I don't know, I spend my time on a college campus and I keep perhaps delusionally trying to like console myself that this is gonna like generate a whole new generation of activism. Like if it produces 10 times the activism that say the 60s did, it's still gonna be an uphill battle to undo the damage that's gonna be done in these next four years, I suspect. So. I don't know, I don't have a whole lot of grounds for not being despairing in these times, and you guys get to live here and watch this day by day. I at least get to live out in La La Land, out in California, and sort of ignore it when we want to. Okay, so thank you.